All right, Monty, before you light it up, a couple things. I noticed pictures of Vietnam era seals, they didn't use bipods. Have you ever seen any with bipods? Never have. All the, all the photographs from the guys I knew that were actually over there and talking to them, they never saw them. Uh, they usually used to sling it up, and the, the weapon, is, as we've talked about before, is so light, they never really shot it from the bipod in the jungle. They were always shooting on their knees, not a whole lot of room on getting all the way down. So not much use for the bipod in it. And now we've shot the Stoner 63. You can see why they made sure they moved, when they went to the 63A, they moved the belt feed to the other side in order to get away from the ejection port. Yeah, obviously it's, it, with the reconfigurable you know, ness of the weapon, flipping the receiver upside down the way they had it before, feeding from the left-hand side, it was ejecting the rounds into the back of the feed box, which obviously caused a lot of jam. So as you and me will appreciate, now being a right-hand feed weapon, it actually did away with that. They uh, added the covers for yep. each the, the which uh, is a plus. Yep, for the link and the brass as well, and it's left-handed friendly, and uh, basically it solves the problem of having the, the brass bounce back into the gun from bouncing into the back of the feed box. Now, one thing I've heard is that shorter barrel length and the fact that your muzzle's right there, just past the gas block. We kind of know in the AR world, now granted this is a piston gun, it's not a direct impingement, but we know in the AR world that leads to some reliability issues. And I've heard the same thing about the commando length gun. I've heard the same thing as, as from some of the guys who were over there too. The shorter barrels, they liked them because they're a lot more maneuverable in the jungle. Once again, they had to be on top of the maintenance of the weapon and they could keep it going. But as you say, you know, the, the shorter dwell time, I think whether it's piston or DI, cutting the dwell time like that gives you a narrower window of operation with port pressures on your ammunition. Absolutely, and you know what we've seen with ARs now and the M4 and whatnot, even just a couple inches makes all the difference in the world. So I guarantee if they'd have taken that barrel and just stretched out a couple inches, it would have made a big difference on the reliability of the gun. Agreed, you know, talking even some of the reps from the larger companies, you know, larger companies uh, such as Colt, they don't like sending, uh, selling the, uh, the, the 11 and a half inch guns. Yeah. I mean, the 10 and a half inch guns, I mean, to law enforcement, whereas military, they have a much tighter spec, whereas law enforcement a lot of times taps in the commercial market. Right, for ammo, so the ammo's kind of all over the map. And so 11 and a half inch, that, that inch and a half makes a huge difference on yep. the reliability of the gun. Cool, hey, without any further ado, enjoy it. Stoner right. 63A. All right, Monty, Stoner 63A, give me your first impressions here. I love this thing. I, it's great. I could definitely see why the guys back in the day fell in love with it, you know what I mean, and why so many guys carried it and why it was one of their favorites. Yeah, it was complex, but, you know, shooting it here today, we had no hiccups with it. The thing ran great. Um, it's so lightweight and so controllable. The 63 that we shot before, a little bit more controllable, but once again, a little bit heavier the longer barrel. But you know what, with the short barrel, I can see why guys didn't even bother running with the, uh, with the bipods at all. You can lay down in the prone, drop it on the box magazine and the framework there, thing is super stable. It's almost as controllable as the, uh, as the 63. So I could definitely see why it was a favorite of the guys. Yeah, and I noticed, you're right, today, <clears throat> no issues whatsoever between the 63 or the 63A. And one of the keys is we made sure the gun was good and wet. I noticed that earlier on. If you lube it like you do a normal firearm, it's just insufficient. You don't have a lot of energy in a 5.56 belt fed to run the gun. And so you gotta make sure that the thing's well lubricated. So the friction's way down, and dude, it ran like a champ, so did the 63. Yeah, this is definitely the rarity of this gun, oh, the coolness of this gun, and for me, the history of the gun yeah. with the teams and everything else like that, definitely a holy grail, and this is, this is a cool piece. As far as belt feds go, Ooh, dude, that's way up there. That's way up there in one of the coolest, if not the coolest belt fit around. I agree.
I wouldn't, you know, I could definitely say thank you for having me out and shooting. This is definitely a holy grail. Thing. Hey, dude, you're welcome. Special thanks to some friends of ours, Jerry Tarball. Jerry, good guy. And Mongo. He has a internet page on the Stoner 63 and amongst other information, but he's a wealth of knowledge, big Stoner 63 guy. So I want to shout out to both those guys and a buddy of mine up in Cincinnati named Ken who helped out sourcing these guns. Thanks a million. Hope you enjoyed it. Stoner 63, Monty LeClaire, Larry Vickers, out.